Good morning. Welcome in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's you and I begin with prayer. Oh Lord, we so often forget the marvel and wonder of your grace because in our everyday lives, we forget the power and joy of your Holy Spirit working in us. Your Spirit works through the means of grace, the gospel, the word, and sacrament. As we worship today and every day, may this gospel means touch our hearts and lives to strengthen our faith and assure us of our salvation in Jesus alone. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Dear children of our Lord and Savior, let us bow our heads and prepare for worship and the contemplation of God's word by confession of our sins. Holy Father, it is with great humbleness that we approach your throne in majesty. We know that we are unworthy before you, for we, by nature, are sinful in thought, word, and deed. We confess our numerous sins, that we have failed to do what you command, and that we have continued to do what you forbid. But we know that your love for us in our Savior Jesus is there. You sent him to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. For his name's sake, we confess our deep sorrow for disobedience and appeal to your grace and mercy for your forgiveness. It is in and through your love that we can confess, and it is because of your tender care and compassion that we humble ourselves and seek your forgiveness, your gift of redemption, and the faith to know that in Jesus, salvation is ours. Dear friends, Please know the mercy and grace of God. Know how he has sent his son to be our redeemer, to purchase and win for us forgiveness, and with forgiveness, that precious promise of eternal life and salvation. We hear the urgent plea of Jesus on the cross, words for all of us, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And because of his victory from the grave, we also hear the words of Jesus, that Jesus spoke to the paralytic as, as belonging to us, your sins have been forgiven. Go then in the peace of Jesus, knowing that by grace through faith, you are counted as reconciled before the Lord our God. Peace be with you. Amen. Pray. O oh God, you form the minds of your faithful people into a single will. Make us love what you command and desire what you promise. That among the many changes of this world, our hearts may ever yearn for the lasting joys of heaven. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let's then turn our attention to the word of our God for this, the fifth Sunday of Easter, or the fifth day of, or the fifth celebration of resurrection. Our text is the historic text of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 12. Do note that this text, or a portion of this text, will serve as the basis for our sermon. When Paul and Silas had traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As was his custom, Paul went to the Jews, and on three Sabbath days, he led them in a discussion from the scriptures explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. He also said, This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great number of God-fearing Greeks and more than a few of the prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and gathered from the marketplace some wicked men who formed a mob and started a riot in the city. They rushed to Jason's house and searched for Paul and Silas in order to bring them out to the mob. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, These men who have stirred up trouble all over the world have come here too, and Jason has welcomed them as guests. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king, Jesus. The crowd of the city officials were stirred up when they heard these things. They took a security bond from Jason and the others and then let them go. That same night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas away to Berea. When they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now, the Bereans were more noble-minded than the Thessalonians, 
They received the word very eagerly and examined the scriptures every day to see if these things were so. Many of them believed, along with more than a few prominent Greek women and men. Here ends our lesson. Let's then join together in our psalm lesson. Our psalm lesson today is Psalm 33. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made, their starry host by the breath of his mouth. For he spoke and came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever, the purposes of his heart through all generations. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. Here ends our psalm lesson. Let's then turn our attention to our epistle lesson for today. Our epistle lesson is found recorded for us in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10. We're reminded that we are the living stones, that, that royal priesthood of God. As you come to him, the living stone rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious, you also, like living stones, are being built as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood in order to bring spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it says in scripture, see, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who believes in him will certainly not be put to shame. Therefore, for you who believe, this is an honor, but for those who do not believe, the stone which the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone over which they stumble and a rock over which they fall. Because they continue to disobey the word, they stumble over it, and that is the consequence appointed for them. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, the people who are God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. At one time, you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. At one time, you were not shown mercy, but now you have been shown mercy. Here ends our epistle lesson. Alleluia, alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. I am the way, the truth, and the life, says the Lord. Alleluia. Our gospel lesson for today is found recorded for us in John chapter 14, verses 1 through 12. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Do not let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to be with me so that you may also be where I am. You know where I am going, and you know the way. Lord, we don't know where you are going, Thomas replied. So how can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you would also know my Father. For from now on, you do know him and have seen him. Lord, said Philip, show us the Father, and that is enough for us. Have I been with you so long, Jesus answered, and you still do not know me, Philip? The one who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words that I'm telling you, I am not speaking on my own, but the Father who remains in me is doing his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or else believe because of the works themselves. Amen, amen, I tell you. The one who believes in me will do the works that I am doing. And he will do even greater works than these because I am going to the Father. Here ends our scripture lesson. Let's then turn our attention to our sermon for today. Our sermon for today is based on Acts chapter 17, verses 2 through 3. As was his custom, 
Paul went to the Jews, and on three Sabbath days, he led them in a discussion from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. He also said, this Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Thus far, God's word, that you and I continue with prayer. O gracious and merciful Father, we give you thanks for the precious gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What awe and marvel, what joy and might is found in this precious gospel of Jesus. Help us to preach that gospel. Help us to be focused on that gospel. Help us to realize that the gospel is the heart and core of our Christian faith. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to start because I'm going to tell you something that I, that I find just a bit disturbing. Now, during this pandemic and the social distancing that we're involved in, I, I spend most of my mornings on Sunday mornings, where, you know, where I would normally be involved in conducting church services. I now spend my mornings watching other worship services, specifically listening to and watching other sermons. And, and most of the time, I hear exactly what I expect to hear, but a number of times, a number of times, I am deeply disappointed in what I hear. And let me tell you why. As a Lutheran, my understanding of God's word leads me to grasp that the Holy Spirit works in the souls of God's people through the gospel in word and sacrament. Notice, I did not say God's Holy Spirit works through the preaching of God's word. What I said was something more specific. I said that God's Holy Spirit works in us through the gospel in word and sacrament. That's known as something called, that's something called the, the means of grace. Now, the means of grace is the way that God tells us, God tells us, he is going to share with us his Holy Spirit and his grace and love. The means of grace is the gospel. Notice that the gospel can be found in the preached or taught word, and the gospel can be found in the very power, as the very power behind the sacraments of the church. Clearly, that tells us that the gospel is something specific. It's not just preaching or teaching. It's not just that you use the Bible. It, it's not just that you throw the name of Jesus around. I believe the gospel is something more specific. Now, I, I'm sure at this point you would like to know what I believe this specific gospel is. The gospel is the good news that God in love sent Jesus to take away the sins of all people. You want to hear that again? The gospel is the good news that God in love sent Jesus to take away the sins of all people. Now, that definition is actually found in our Quisky edition of Luther's Catechism. It's a very simple definition. It's an important definition. It tells us that if we are not hearing about our sin and that Jesus came to pay for that sin because of God's love for us, then we are not hearing the gospel message. I believe every single sermon, in order to be the, of the best benefit to the soul, needs to have that specific and pointed message of Jesus found in it. In reality, as a Lutheran, I believe that every single sermon should have as its focus the gospel of Jesus. The Lutheran sermon should just ooze Jesus. The Lutheran sermon should emphasize Jesus and what he has done and accomplished for us because of God's grace, mercy, and love. Every time a sermon is done, every hearer should be able to clearly say, I have heard the gospel of Jesus for my salvation's sake. Yet, in some of the sermons that I've heard, it's not true. So, so here's my challenge to any who might hear my words. Here's my challenge to anyone who might declare themselves a preacher of God's word or God's gospel. Here's my challenge to anyone, especially to anyone who calls himself a Lutheran. After you are done preaching your sermon, could you be sure that your sermon could not be used in any other church body? In other words, is your sermon so Lutheran that no other preacher would dare use it in his church? Or... Do you find that your sermon, with little to no changes, could be used in a Baptist, a Methodist, or a Catholic church 
or actually by any other Christian denomination pastor, worse yet, worse yet, could your sermon actually be used by a rabbi or a Muslim cleric as a sermon in their church? And, and the only difference being, of course, that the name of Jesus be changed or that God always be called Allah. See, now I issue that challenge because I'm a firm believer in the fact that there are only two religions in the world. There are the churches of work righteousness and there is the true Christian church that proclaims clearly and absolutely the gospel message of Jesus. Gospel as defined earlier. Because in truth, if you are preaching nothing more than a work righteous sermon or a work righteous religion, even though you're using the name of Jesus, you are not preaching the gospel. You are not serving the Lord and his son our Savior, Jesus. I can guarantee that the apostles, Paul and Silas, did not have to worry about this challenge. I say that because of what's said in our text for today. So let's learn what makes the message of Jesus so awesome. Our theme will be, Jesus is the Christ. Now, our text actually finds Paul and Silas involved in Paul's second missionary journey. That journey took place between 49 and 52 A.D., and it covered most of what we will call the Mediterranean world. They are out sharing the message of Jesus for the sake of souls. And in our text, we hear that they are entering the city of Thessalonica, and here, because of the presence of a Jewish synagogue, they have stopped to share the message that they believe is so important for people to hear. Now, in case you're wondering, Paul and Silas usually started mission work in Jewish synagogues for two reasons that these synagogues had as their base the word of God found in the Old Testament and that Jesus was and is the fulfillment of that word of God. In other words, it was a base, an easy starting point for the message that they had. That's why our text calls, says that this was his custom. It's how Paul has done things ever since he himself learned the truth of Jesus. Now, did you pay attention to what was taught? These words are so important. The text says, he led them in a discussion from the scriptures, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. He also said, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. Now let's you and I understand exactly what these words mean, because here is God's Holy Spirit showing us exactly how souls were brought to faith in Jesus. So, so what was the message of Paul and Silas, and I believe every apostle and true preacher of the message of the gospel? Point one, he led them in a discussion from the scripture. The message was centered on the scripture. The message was based on what the scripture said. Please note that we are actually talking the Old Testament in this case, the, the New Testament while parts of it are completed and well known, is still being composed through the work of the Holy Spirit. So for instance, I believe that 13 of the 27 books of the, of the New Testament are works of the Holy Spirit through Paul. So it's still being compiled. So when it speaks of the fact that they had a discussion from the scripture, it's rather clear that it is the Old Testament that's being spoken of because the New Testament is not fully written yet. And by the way, that, that shouldn't surprise us. Jesus made it clear in his ministry that the entire Old Testament was about him. I want you to think about what happened when the two disciples, with the two disciples on their way to Emmaus. Jesus met with them, and the discussion is described this way. He said to them, How foolish you are and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and to enter his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Sounds like Jesus and the two disciples on the way to Emmaus had the same conversation that our text speaks of. And it starts with scripture. That's because the scripture is God's word. That's because the Bible, yes, even the Old Testament reveals God's plan and God's will in regard to sin and grace and damnation and salvation. From beginning to end, it is a revelation of God's saving work revealed in the promises and the prophecies and the type of Christ and in history. In other words, it's a book about Jesus. From beginning to end, it's a book about Jesus. 
So if you want to learn of salvation, if you want to learn about eternal life, then the place to start is with the scripture. And I will even say at this point, for those of you who might get confused, that the New Testament is certainly also very much God's word. And it gives us even more clearly the truth and wonder of our salvation and the marvel of the gospel. Point two, explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. Here is the central message they focused on when it came to their discussion. They are not discussing how to keep the law or exactly what God's will is or exactly what is the purpose of God for our lives. Notice they are not focused on our good works or our abilities. They're not focused on the law of God and how we are to obey the work of Jesus. The scripture was used to focus on the Christ, specifically to focus on the fact that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead. That is one awesome statement. In other words, everything we need to know about the work of Jesus is already revealed in the scripture, yeah, in the Old Testament. But of course, we, we get confused sometimes. You see, we think the Old Testament is about the law, about how to live God's way and how to do things in accord with what God has revealed uh, and that. But, but dear people, that's the same mistake the Jewish people made. They decided somewhere along the line in their religion that the point of the law was so that they could, the law could serve as a guide to show them how to get to heaven. But, but that's not the purpose of the law. The law was about sin. The law was about revealing, condemning, and showing the total disparity that sin has brought to our world. The point of God's law was to reveal sin and the fact that we could not, would not, and never will meet the standard of God for eternal life. And that standard, by the way, is that we be perfect. Totally, absolutely, flawlessly, in thought, word, and deed, holy. We can't do it. But Jesus could and did. Jesus came to live the perfect life we could not, and then Jesus became the perfect and atoning sacrifice for our sin. That sacrifice of Jesus was also a part of the law, by the way, which is something that we call the ceremonial law. That ceremonial law was always pointing to Jesus, how the Christ would shed his blood, how the Christ would die for us, and with that death atone for us, yeah, redeem us from the problem of sin. A serious study of the law shows that. Almost everything about the law shouts and cries that someday, one day, the Christ of God would come and he would take care of the problem of sin. That's what our text is speaking of when it says they use the scripture explaining and proving that the Christ had to suffer. The law of God made it clear we needed a savior. The law of God foreshadowed the savior and his work, namely, that the Christ had to suffer and die to atone for our sin. That is the point. Central theme, the center, central theme of God's Old Testament. But that wasn't all that was discussed. On, on the basis of the Old Testament, the discussion also spoke of something else, something that we miss. We miss the importance of this because sometimes it's just because of the way it's written. But it says this, explaining and proving that the Christ had to rise from the dead. That's right. Another central point of the Old Testament was the resurrection of the Christ. The resurrection was the way that we would know who the Christ is. The resurrection would be the comprehensive and definitive action that would identify the Christ. The Christ would die and the Christ would return to life. Now, what does that statement say of those Christian churches today that don't believe in the actual physical resurrection of Jesus? You need to ask your pastor. Did you know that the majority of the Jewish people of Jesus' day probably did not believe in life after death? That's because their religious leadership had decided that since life after death couldn't be proven, since heaven couldn't be seen, and since they had never seen anyone come back from life after death, therefore, None of it was true. And yet God's word said it was true. See, that's the problem. Souls stop believing what God's word says. 
Souls stop trusting in God and his power. They stop trusting in God and his marvel and, and his might and his knowledge. Yeah, even to the point where we, we think all this stuff about God and salvation and Jesus, we, that's all impossible. But it's not impossible with God. God can and has given us his pure, true, and holy word. God can and has revealed his truth and the wonder of his love. But recognize, as did Paul and Silas, that it's all wrapped up in Jesus as our atoning sacrifice and in Jesus rising from the dead. The scriptures say it is so. Jesus said it is so. You just can't ignore the death and resurrection of Jesus and still think you are a Christian. And then the climax of what was taught. Did you hear it? This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Christ. Jesus is the one who fulfilled these words. Jesus is the one who suffered and died just as God foretold. Jesus is the one, the only one, who died and has risen to life eternally. Therefore, Jesus is the Christ. He is the Savior God has promised. He is the one who gives eternal life and salvation. He is the one who atones for sin and grants on the basis of faith the gift of eternal life and salvation. Simply put, no Jesus, no salvation. N-O Jesus, N-O salvation. Or no Jesus, no salvation, K-N-O-W Jesus. K-N-O-W, salvation. It's all wrapped up in Jesus and his work. Paul and Silas did not spend their time discussing how we are to live, what we are to do, how we can show our love and obedience to God, and on and on. See, the Jewish religion had been doing that for centuries. Yeah, teaching work righteousness instead of a gospel message of salvation by grace through faith. Why would people have to come to faith in Jesus in order to be saved if it's all about how we live and what we do? Paul and Silas preached Jesus, the Christ, the Savior from sin. They preached and taught that Jesus is it. He is the only way. He's the only hope of eternal life. If that weren't true, why would there need to be, why would there be a need for Jesus in the first place in a world that's actually filled with work righteous religion? People, it is Jesus who suffered for our sins. It is Jesus who paid the debt of our transgressions and iniquities by his wounds. It is Jesus who took the punishment that brought us peace. Peace, because it is in Jesus that forgiveness and eternal life is proclaimed. In Jesus, it is that you and I are reconciled. In Jesus, you and I are declared released from damnation. Jesus is the Christ. He is our Lord and Savior, and in him we find all we need to be a child of God. It is clear we need the message of Jesus, specifically that gospel message. We need to hear the gospel and rejoice in the sure salvation that God has granted to us in Jesus. We need to stop thinking it's about what we do or what we are and to, and to realize it is and always has been about Jesus, Jesus, the Christ, the Savior, our Savior, who on the basis of his suffering and resurrection is declared the Christ of God. Lord, please help all of our pastors to preach the awesome gospel of Jesus so that every soul walks away after every sermon and says, I have heard the gospel of Jesus for my salvation's sake. It is our hope and comfort. It's what our faith in Jesus is about. Amen. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds through faith in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I invite you then to join together with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do indeed come to you and give you thanks for this precious gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. What an awesome thing it is to hear the pure and wonderful gospel of Jesus. To hear about the terror of sin, the reality of sin, the destruction that sin has brought into the world, the problems that sin causes us in the world, 
to hear how we fail time and time again to meet the standards of God, to be holy and pure like God our Father is holy and pure. But dear Lord, that gospel message is about how God took care of that problem for us. How God sent his son Jesus to be that atoning sacrifice. How Jesus went to that cross to pay for our sins and then rose from the dead so that we would know his payment was sure and true. What a marvel and a joy it is, dear Lord, to, to grasp this awe and this marvel of, of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Be our help and guide. Be our confidence and our reward. And lead us to contemplate all the more Jesus. Jesus and what he has done. Let us focus on Jesus. Let us focus on the, the horror of our sins and the forgiveness, the depth of forgiveness that Jesus grants to us. And let us all the more proclaim Jesus. Jesus to this world of ours. Jesus to a world that is lost in despair and sin. Jesus to a world that needs to hear that the problem is taken care of and that because of Jesus, heaven is our eternal home. Grant us this marvel, this wonder. Let your Holy Spirit work in us all the more through the means of grace, the gospel, in word and sacrament. And watch over and guide us, dear Lord, during this pandemic. Help us to grasp, dear Lord, that our churches really haven't closed. We're still preaching and teaching the gospel message of Jesus. Right now, the only thing that's happened is that we are not able to meet publicly in worship. But dear Lord, lead us to give worship and praise and glory and honor to Jesus in our homes through the videos and the sermons that our pastors are producing. And lead every one of those videos and sermons to be focused on the gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. These things we ask in the name of Jesus, he who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Receive now with believing hearts the benediction of our Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. Amen.